Please. Oh. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for uh, Council Bill 19-0443. First, I'd like to introduce my colleagues. Uh, to my left, Council President Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councilwoman McRae. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Cohn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Burnett. Thank you. And Councilwoman Sneed. Thank you. And Councilman Pinkett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, people from various agencies who will be presenting. Uh, first, our solicitor, Davis, thank you for being here. Um, Deputy Mayor Snitzer, being here. Um, uh, Mr. Petro from the Law Department, Lieutenant Herzog, um, and Michelle Wurzberger from the Police Department. And I'm sorry, I don't. Sergeant Wilhelm from the uh, Police Department as well. And so I'd like to turn the floor over to the Council President to speak on this bill. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome everybody to the Baltimore City Public Safety Committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm actually going to speak to both bills, if, if you will allow me to. So today we're going to be discussing two pieces of legislation related to the most pressing issue facing our great city, uh, violence and gun violence specifically. Let's not be mistaken. We need immediate action from all of our agencies, most notably our police department, in reducing the unwielding violence that is suffocating our city. Uh, if we know who the violent offenders are, who are committing the violence, we need to take the fight to them, today, tomorrow, and every day until we win this war. Likewise, we need to be focused on the flow of illegal guns into our city. The individuals who are committing these acts need to know that it will not be tolerated and that we will not rest until they are brought to justice. However, we have never and will never reduce or solely, solely reduce or prevent crime through policing alone. A comprehensive approach is the only way Baltimore will cure itself of this disease known as gun violence. And let me be clear to anyone who hears the sound of my voice. Uh, reducing and preventing violence in Baltimore has been a priority of mine and this council. Uh, there's no mistake about that. Let's not make that be mistaken about that. And that will not change as long as I'm here. For three years, this council has been requesting a comprehensive violence and reduction and prevention strategy to be presented. We will tell early this year in July that one will be ready in a few weeks. We have yet to receive it. We appreciate the plan from the police department that includes many things that I and my colleagues have fought for for years, but that is not enough. We must have each agency working every day to reduce and prevent violence in Baltimore, and that's what we'll be discussing today. For me, this is not either the immediate or the long term. We must do both, and we must do both now. Today, we will also be discussing the legislation that we're about to hear uh, to add uh, individuals who gun traffic, straw purchase, and sell guns to minors to our gun offender registry. We know that many of the weapons recovered on the streets of Baltimore used to shoot and rob our family members and neighbors have origins well beyond Maryland, let alone Baltimore City. We must be focused on those individuals who bring those weapons in, much like the individuals who use, the, use them in crimes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the Law Department. Uh, let them know which one bill is for. I, I think we're here. We're starting on the, uh, on the gun offender registry. Yeah, that's what I thought. And we're going to so. have a recess and then move on to the next bill. Okay, Ms. Wurzberger will uh, take it from here. So you want to just stand by your agency report? Yeah. Okay. Police Department. Good evening. Uh, Michelle Wurzberger, Director of Government Affairs for the Baltimore Police Department. Um, you should have our bill report that says that we absolutely support the bill. We do have a few um, um, uh, amendments that we think will make the law stronger, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. I do think all of you have copies of those, but um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Lieutenant Colonel Herzog, uh, who manages this, um, this, has this program in his portfolio. And good evening, Lieutenant Colonel John Herzog from the Criminal Investigation Division. Um, as Michelle said, there are a few amendments that we have in there. Uh, we wanted to include the rifle and shotgun charge, um, also making it from three to five years. And then one of the issues that we currently see now that when individuals are reincarcerated, that their time, the clock continues to tick when they're in Gora. 
So by having that clock stop and that time pick up on the back end is one of the amendments that we think can make it stronger. Can we, can we backtrack just one second before we get into that? If you can just explain for everybody here a little bit more about the uh, gun offender registry and how that works in layman terms and then get into the amendments. Absolutely. So I'm going to turn that over to Sergeant Wilhelm. He actually is the, and the best person. He's been in, in charge of that unit since the existence of it back in 2008. So he'll be able to give you the history and answer any questions that you have for it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Detective Sergeant Mike Wilhelm with the Baltimore City Police Department. I'm the sergeant in charge of the Gun Offender Registry Unit. Um, I've been with the unit since it started. Pull the mic closer to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been with the unit since uh, January 1 of 2008. That's when the uh, Gore Law became uh, active. Um, and I've been with the police department over 27 years. So, um, you asked how the Gun Offender Registry works, and I'll try to explain that as quickly as I can. Um, when somebody is convicted of a crime that's enumerated in the current Gora law, within 48 hours of their release from jail or within 48 hours of their conviction, if they don't go to jail, they're required by law to come into our office and register as a gun offender. Once they conduct that initial registration, they're in the program for a period of three years. Every six months, they're required to come back in and conduct what we call a re-registration to re-verify their information. Additionally, if a gun offender moves from the address that they give us, um, they have 10 days to come in and change that address. If they violate any of those issues, then we're um, enabled to uh, seek an arrest warrant for them for violation of the Gore law. So, <clears throat> and we also conduct home checks. So we do quite a few home checks. That's the way we verify that a offender is living at the address that they give us. So in a nutshell, that's how the Gun Offender Registry Act uh, operates um, within the police department. And I can go over some quick numbers if you would like to kind of show you where we're at now with how many people we have in the Gun Offender Registry uh, database. So currently we have 2,830 active uh, gun offenders within the database. Out of that 2,830, 1,539 are, are what I call active. They are people that have uh, served their time or you know didn't get time and they came in and they're in the process of being in the program for the three years. The remaining 1,291 individuals or people that are still serving their time for their conviction, once they get out, they will have to register with my unit at, at that time. Um, and where I think this law is important, um, one of the things that was done prior, when the, before the law started, they did some studies and they were showing that recidivism rates for people that were uh, arrested or convicted of a handgun or a weapons crime, within the first year of them getting out of jail, 40 to 50% of them were being rearrested for a subsequent handgun charge. Um, not convicted, but arrested. So in the 12 years that the gun offender registry uh, unit has been in place, we currently see a uh, recidivism rate at around 9.3% which, um, and it's kind of, it's more or less ran that way for the last 12 years. So in my opinion, once a gun offender is in the program and are being monitored, working in conjunction with parole and probation, um, it, it keeps down people from getting rearrested for uh, another handgun or a weapons violation, which is, I believe, why we're here today. So by strengthening these laws, um, we do have people to get rearrested for handguns, so it's, it's, it's a further way to try to get them not to, you know, engage in, in uh, criminal behavior using a weapon or a handgun or assault weapon, uh, whatever you might have. So, did you have any further yeah, so questions? Was that a recidivism rate? Was that only in the first year, or is that in total people once they're on? How many people reoffend and end up back on the registry? Okay, can you say that again. I got a you, you were talking about the um, how the rates have dropped since you you've had this registration and people have to register, and how few people come back on the registration. The question is. Are you talking about only within the first year? That's the percentage that reoffend and then so, back on. Go ahead. So when they did the study prior to my involvement, when the Gun Offender Registry Act, um, when um, within the first year of a person getting released from jail after having been convicted of a crime or being rearrested and, and say their crime was adjudicated, within the first year, 40 to 50 percent of those individuals were being rearrested for another handgun or a weapons violation. So the thought was back 12 years ago by implementing GORA that the goal was to try to reduce that recidivism rate um, by any means, you know, and over time that recidivism rate has ran around nine to 10 percent. So going from 40 to 50 percent um, prior to the implementation of the Gun Offender Registry Act law to over the last 12 years, a recidivism rate of nine, between nine and 10 percent, it fluctuates a little bit, but currently it sits at 9.3. 
And once again, that's only for a person being rearrested for another handgun once they're in Gora. Um, overall, um, out of the 1,539 gun offenders that I'm currently uh, monitoring, the recidivism rate overall is only 32%, which I, that's overall, that's for any type of an arrest to include weapons violations. But I break it down further by um, which individuals were arrested for a handgun or a weapons violation. So, so it went from 40 to 50% 50 50 prior to Gora to running under 10% over the 12 years that we've been operating. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions? Thank you, actually. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sergeant. This is for either you or or the Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, knowing uh, the amount of uh, weapons that travel from other states into Baltimore City, do you guys have any clue or idea why uh, the the individuals that we're adding to this legislation, this law today, were not included when we originally created the bill? <clears throat> I, I couldn't honestly answer that question, sir. Uh, I, I wasn't involved in the uh, thought process that went behind when they uh, started the bill. Um, I can, I mean, I don't even want to guess, but, you know, obviously the laws that you're trying to put in there would, would, would seal it up to include every type of weapons violation that currently exists in the Maryland Annotated Code. Um, but, but to an answer directly to your question, I, I couldn't tell you that and um, why they didn't include those specific charges in the original law. Because that, it's my understanding that we do have individuals who are not residents of Baltimore, clearly, but even not residents of the state that also are on the Gora list, correct? Yeah, so, and just let me uh, clarify that. In order for a person to be, um, had, for, in order for a person to participate in Gora, they, they would have to have committed the crime within Baltimore City and be convicted within Baltimore City. So regardless of where that individual says they live, whether it be California, Maryland, Virginia, if the crime was committed in the city and conviction took place in the city, then they have to register as a gun offender. Um, even And we've had challenges to the law over the years where people say, well, I live in a county, I don't have to participate, but all those challenges have been upheld through uh, court proceedings where judges deemed that the law was uh, valid. So. Thank you. And, and Colonel, this is this is uh, for you and uh, Richard. If we could, could we cut the mic on at the seat so they have to keep switching seats? For you, are we still? I know this is something you and I talk about consistently. Are we still seeing a good bit of uh, weapons come from outside of the city and outside of the state that you guys are recovering on the streets? Yes, yeah, so just to be blunt about it, we still are. Um, a lot of them come from the surrounding counties um, in Maryland as well as some of the surrounding states. Yes, sir. And do you think, in your professional opinion, trying to have more of a focus on that flow of weapons and the individuals who are bringing them will be um, advantageous for you and your folks as you're engaged in the, in the violent crime fight in Baltimore? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Vice Chair. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do, you, do you have data available on the uh, number of uh, arrests that have occurred for not re-registering after a move? And what percentage that represents of the total violations? Yes, sir. So c currently, as it stands right now, 114 uh, gun offender registrants have uh, been charged with violating a Gora statue. Um, and you asked specifically how many of them were charged with not changing their address. Uh, I don't have that specific data in front of me, sir. Um, but there's only three things a gun offender can be charged with for violation. That's either they didn't register initially, they didn't conduct a re-registration every six months, or if they moved, they didn't change their address. But uh, I don't have that 114 number broke down to those three categories at this time. I think that, that would be helpful for me. Um, if we could have that provided to the committee. Any other questions? You all mentioned uh, the um, the guns coming from other states. I'm just wondering, do we do we work with the other states? Have we ever gotten together with uh, the other agencies in another state to work with them to I don't know come up with some kind of strategy for for both states to kind of get 
the guns under control? I mean, I, I'm just wondering if there was ever a conversation had. Um, and, and so we have worked with other jurisdictions and other states, but our biggest partner when it comes to cross borders, um, cross state borders, is the ATF, who we work closely with. Okay, Lieutenant Colonel, would you like to uh, speak to just review the amendments real quick and then we'll make a motion? Uh, so the proposals that we had were changing it from three years to five years of, of being on, on the uh, uh, gun offender registry. Also um, making it to where the time would stop if you are rearrested for a second handgun offense or a gun offense that's, that's written into the law. And then once you were released, that clock would pick back up again. And then in addition to that, you would start your additional five years. Um, and then also the last uh, change would be adding in persons convicted of crimes of violence prohibited from uh, possessing a rifle or a shotgun. So really, the, and just those three changes. Okay, and before we move those amendments, is there anybody from the public that would like to testify in this gun offender bill? All right, come on up. My name is Dwayne Gerald Davis Sr. Everybody call me Shorty. I testify against this because y'all ain't addressing the issue of the violence in Baltimore City. I'm 60 years old. I've been in the streets since I was 12. It's the war on drugs and you just say it out your mouth about the war and ain't nobody talking about the war on drugs. That's the root of the violence. This gun registry, this time on time that you're talking about giving people, all that doing is putting money in somebody else's pocket. We already can't get housing, so how am I registered? Where am I registered at? I'm homeless, so where am I registered at? You feel me? So you asking and putting barriers and boundaries on people that can't already, whatever. In the war on drugs, let's start having that conversation because that's the root of the violence in Baltimore City, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia. Y'all writing new laws to further incarcerate us. We traded the penitentiary for the plantation, cotton for cocaine, and we the cash crop. You're giving treatment to opioids, but you're locking us up. You got marijuana houses on the corner and call them dispensaries. You just put a suit and a tie on another drug dealer, but you're still locking Bobby up. Man, think about that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Councilman Pinkett, you had a question before. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it was mentioned, the collaboration, I guess, with the ATF. Um, can you speak more to, I mean, we appreciate the collaboration. Oh, hold on, hold on. You got, hold on. Sir. I forgot one fact. It's very important dealing with this gun. Go ahead, just come. All right. I came in straight out of the penitentiary in 1991 on the interstate compact. I had to get money my first two or three years because I was homeless. I bought guns out of the FOP on Harford Road from police officers. I can show you where your state's attorney and your police is releasing guns back into the streets. So to get a scenario about this out of towner, no, this homegrown. Councilman Pinkett. Yeah, um, I, I, I wanted to hear more about the collaboration with the ATF and, and what those efforts look like, both um, as it relates to guns coming in and then identifying you know, locations within the city where um, people are able to purchase illegal guns. Um, and so we have task force officers um, from Baltimore police who are embedded into different groups with um, ATF. We also have ATF agents who work directly with specific units within um, BPD, our robbery and our homicide unit. Um, and so really what they do is when we look at um, the E-Trace data, where we trace the gun back to the original owner and then we look at how that gun has been transferred over time, we look at time to crime, we also look at um, maybe if, a, if an individual has reported multiple guns stolen over a short period of time and look for those things that we, that we would consider um, triggers that would identify a potential um, gun trafficker. And so at that point, then we work with the ATF, who really is our, is our biggest partner, as I said. We also work with some of our other federal partners, but mainly ATF to proactively target and build strong prosecutable cases against those individuals that we identify through the data. In, in, in many of the conversations I, I have with individuals on the street, um, it, it seems to be almost common knowledge where an individual can get an illegal gun. Um, 
And so, uh, in not saying that the, the police aren't doing what they need to do as far as investigating, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to find out if, if it's common on the street where you can get an illegal gun, why don't, why don't law enforcement know where those, those guns are coming from as well? Um, so the only thing I could say to that is that we are working to identify those places that you're referring to um, and identify those individuals who, who everybody in the street knows that you can go to to um, obtain a firearm. So those are things that we you know, are working on day in and day out. Um, and that really is, is really the only thing I could say. That. Have we, have we, when was the last time we made a major arrest of, a, of a, an illegal gun dealer in the city? Um, I can't give you an exact date, but I know we have had, a, had, have had several this year. But you can't give me a, any, any idea of when the last time was? Any, any sense? Now, I can tell you that we have had it this year. Um, specifically, um, there was a case that we worked with our federal partners. Um, I can't re recollect exactly what month it was, but we did have a case where the, it, it involved um, burglarizing gun stores out of state and then transporting those weapons back into the city and then selling them. So we were able to uh, um, affect arrests and recover a significant amount of guns, which I believe was over 50 at the time of the mm -hmm. arrest. I mean, because if you talk to some, and, and, and all of this is anecdotal, I can't give you, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and tell you I'm giving, you know, um, fa you know, direct facts and tell you exactly where, but if you talk to certain individuals, they can, they can tell you what stores you can go to in, in the back rooms and get guns. And Councilman, we will, when we follow up, there's a, a couple of items that, that the committee has requested that we provide you all. We can absolutely provide you the list with uh, details of all of those, those arrests and what they seized at the, during the arrest. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'll just leave it at this. I mean, and I'm glad that we're, we're having this hearing and then we'll have the subsequent hearing, is that, you know, clearly um, in, in certain communities, it's easier to get it's, it's easier to get a gun than it is to get fresh fruit. I mean, you can, you can go to a corner store, you can go to you know, certain places and get a gun um, more quickly than you can get you know, produce. And we've got to get these guns off the street. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council President. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Councilman. I think, uh, Councilman, I think you will, would also re remember that uh, last year uh, we had uh, Agent Sakata from ATF before the council and we were talking with him specifically about the need to focus and if he thought as the, the special agent in charge that we need to focus more on gun traffickers and straw purchasing and, and he said to us very very bluntly that yes we do and that we also need to uh, strengthen laws around gun purchasing and trafficking both at, at all at the local state and the, and the national level. We had some minor success at the state level, national levels are different. We're here today talking about locally, but also, Colonel, this is something, so I agree wholeheartedly with the councilman that I think about all the time, and I know that I, I said this before. Uh, if we know that guns are at the epicenter of so much violence in Baltimore, why do we not treat them the same way that we treat drugs? For example, if I am a patrol officer or someone else, uh, what we have done in the history of Baltimore City and we arrest someone from some a small amount of a, a controlled substance, which we know has been proven time and time again not to have a great impact on reducing violence, right? So we know that I agree with Shorty that the war on drugs is the first failed war in, in the United States since Vietnam. But what we do is we try to flip that person up the chain. Right, you try to get them to the bigger fish. But it seems to me that we don't do the same thing with guns. If we find a young man or a young woman or an old man or an old woman with a gun, it just ends at that one case. Why are we not building the bigger case to find the bigger fish for the guns? Is that a leadership decision? Is that something that just seems too hard to do? Because my gut tells me that it's the same. It's the same people. And we know that these are the people that are committing the violence. And when, again, like I said earlier, I want you guys focus on those people all day, every day. I don't need you uh, focus on people that are just addicted to drugs. We have a health department. We have to solve that issue in a different way. But the people who are killing and robbing people, I want you to focus on them. But I also want to follow 
those guns. I want to follow those guns to their origin so that we can stop the flow of them into our city. So can you just talk about like how we would or why we aren't doing that or what you would need from us in order for you guys to do that? Um, and and so and there's definitely no decision made to say not to do that. So I would say that that is is 100 percent in place. Um, we have debriefing protocols. So every single arrest is debriefed. And that is one of the questions that we that we follow up on and that we ask during those debriefings is where um, do you know anybody who's trafficking firearms? Do you know anybody that's concealing firearms? And then anybody who is arrested with a firearm is debriefed. And that is information that we try to obtain. Um, so a lot, you know, a large portion of that and kind of just anecdotally what I see is that a lot of these guns are being purchased just from somebody randomly on the street and we and we're provided a nickname. So really where the legwork comes in, um, and I don't think this is an ask of something that we need from from the council is really looking at that at that trace data and seeing if we can find those common links and those commonalities between the firearms. Um, so and that is something that we are currently doing. Uh, would I like to see it done more? Absolutely, I would always like to see it done more. Um, but I think that the recipe is there, and it's just a matter of expanding on that and getting a few better, uh, a few more success stories out of it. Thank you. And just this is a follow-up because this is something else that we push. This is how we got into this conversation: is uh, about having the Gun Crime Intelligence Center. Are we fully operational with that? Are we meeting the standards that they want as far as the trace data, or do you guys still need more resources in order to? follow that because I would think that if we're able to trace these weapons back to their origin where they come from then we can build the case reverse build the case because they sold it or give it go gave it to somebody or was stolen from somebody who gave it to somebody else right so what what else is in place are we fully operational for the gun crime intelligence center are we meeting the federal standard I think it's 48 hours right are yes. we at that standard now Yes. Yeah, so um, actually, our lab is number one in the in the country right now for turning around those um, Nibin leads, um, and they're you know, doing a great job. We are fully operational with the Crime Gun Intelligence Center, um, and we are working on improving um, how we utilize that and that trace data so that we can identify problematic owners and problematic gun stores outside of the city, um, so that way we, uh, we can work with our federal partners to hold them accountable. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Mr. President, if I may. Oh, Are yes, you? sir. Sorry. Because uh, you asked a good question. I just want to, if I may, uh, build on Lieutenant Colonel's uh, observations. It's important for people to understand, as uh, Lieutenant Colonel mentioned, the debriefing takes place immediately after an arrest or a, a detention. But once a person is charged, that case now belongs to the state's attorney. Mm -hmm. And the Baltimore City Police Department may not, under the Constitution, go back and talk to that person without his lawyer present. And so, again, I think you asked a good question, but the idea of trying to build cases on guns the way historically cases have been built on drugs really is a proposition that should be put to the state's attorney's office. Yeah, we've had that conversation, but I think that also knowing uh, how many drug cases have been done at the level before it gets to BPD, I think that we have to do both, but thank you. And, you know, also you and I can talk later and offline about what we can do about gun companies and other stuff. Mr. Chair. Councilman Cohn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for testifying. Uh, this is a question for uh, Solicitor Davis. Uh, what are we doing as a city to hold gun manufacturers accountable for the carnage that we see in Baltimore? Now, I noticed that in Sandy Hook, uh, after the shooting that occurred there where 26 people lost their lives, they sued Remington Arms, uh, which was the manufacturer of the rifle that was used in that shooting. And yet in Baltimore, we're losing 300 plus people per year to gun violence. Uh, someone is getting rich off of our suffering. So as a city, I know that we've enjoined other lawsuits related to uh, manufacturers of opioids. Um, what are we doing to hold gun manufacturers accountable for what they contribute to the violence in Baltimore? Great question, Councilman. I can assure you not just Baltimore City, 
but every city in America is monitoring that case arising out of Sandy Hook. As you know, that case involves that particular military weapon that was used by that young man to kill all those poor children. And that decision by the Court of Appeals a couple of weeks ago was a breakthrough because Congress has created immunity for these gun manufacturers that up until now has been impenetrable, impenetrable. And this recent decision is the first small crack in the wall. And we will continue to monitor it. Believe me, um, America would be tremendously served if the courts could find a way to say to the gun manufacturers, you do have some responsibility here. So we are very definitely monitoring. So and, and by the way, you may know, uh, here in Maryland, about 20 years or so ago, in the late 90s, our own Court of Appeals did not recognize a claim brought against the gun manufacturer for the, for the harm that guns cause. The court said, gun is intended to harm people, and therefore it wasn't an unreasonably dangerous instrumentality. Maybe 20 years later, 25 years later, maybe courts are prepared to take a slightly different look at that. So just to sort of paraphrase, if their lawsuit is successful, then Baltimore and other jurisdictions will follow suit and explore the possibility of ourselves enacting legal action toward manufacturers of firearms. Absolutely. They are a long way from success. Sure. This recent decision is just a very preliminary decision, still very early in the case, but as I say, it's a small crack on those specific facts in that case, but that's what you need to break down a wall. You, you need a first a, a small crack. And yes, if, if the law evolves the way many of us hope it does, change will be in the wind for sure. And I would just say that it's a shame that, uh, uh, and I don't in any way want to diminish the horror and pain in that community, um, but uh, 26 children lost their lives. We've been losing hundreds of children in our city for years and years and years and years, and that that pain has largely been ignored. Um, I, I do think that manufacturers, those that profit the most off of the pain, should be held accountable. No disagreement in this room, Councilman. Thanks. Do we have a motion to move the amendments? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. Okay. Oh, sorry. And um, so we'll move the bill forward. Okay. Anybody want to move the bill favorable? As so moved. As amended. Mr. Cohen moves the bill favorable as amended. Second. second. Chairman Schleifer. Yes. Chairman Schleifer votes aye. Vice Chair Burnett. No. Vice Chair Burnett votes nay. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Member McRae? Yes. Member McRae votes aye. Mr. Pinkett. Yes. Mr. Pinkett votes aye. Member Sneed? Yes. Member Sneed votes aye. Mr. Chair, there are five votes in the affirmative. One negative. Uh, the bill can move to uh, second reader at the next meeting if that's the desire of the yeah. Yes, thank you. We will take a five minute recess and then proceed with the next bill.